Did you ever wonder how your dog got here, here to your pack? Not just in the fact that you adopted them, but here, here in this place, in this time. How have dogs and humans journeyed along the same path for so long? Is your dog domesticated? Or is it really a wolf that happens to live with you? Humans have had this question about the relationship between them and their dogs since our history on this planet. Is your dog really who you think it is? Doggy DNA. <laughs> All right, so I guess we're talking about dogs today. We're you talking about doggy DNA, I hear. Is your dog really who you think he is or she is? Yeah, do they know who they are? I think is the question. <laughs> so did I ever tell you how I got my first dog? I think you did, but can you refresh my memory? So when I was five, Santa likes to bring dogs to this family, apparently. And uh, he um, he brought me a Yorkshire Terrier. And when I woke up, I wanted a dog so bad. And uh, my parents kept saying, no, 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 no. So Santa came through and he, you know, I remember waking up on Christmas morning and there was a dog licking my face. That was how I woke up. The dog woke me up. And um, what's really funny is that that dog actually died that week. Um, and my parents never told me and just replaced him on New Year's Eve. So they replaced, they replaced the dog and, uh, the new dog, which to me was the old dog until I was 20 something years old. And they finally told me, uh, the dog got hit by a car when, um, about five years later. So, um, and that was probably I don't know. That experience for me has me so traumatized. You know, it was like this really exciting thing. This dog was so good. We'd play all the time. We'd go for walks. He was this great dog. You know, he was really like just just exactly what a child needed, you know, and um, his personality was perfect. And the gardeners left the gate open and uh, they left. And then he was chasing a squirrel into the street and he got hit by a bus. So, I, uh, right in front of our house and it was just a really rough experience, but it, it really devastated me. And, and I feel so protective over my dogs now and mm -hmm. so worried all the time because like, I just love them so much and I want them to live forever, you know? And I, mm -hmm. I just, but I, that was how I got my first dog. And I thought it was pretty funny that the dog actually died that week, even though that's not funny, but no, yeah. he did. Um, and well. then they just replaced him. Yeah, I, you know, for 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 me, I don't actually ever remember not having dogs. I remember there always being dogs there as part of our family. So it's 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 interesting. Like I don't remember the first time we got a dog. You know, I just remember they were always there. They were always part of the family. And you know, I mean, you know, unfortunately, dogs don't have the lifespan we do. And we, but we've had a lot of dogs in our lives that have been part of our family, which I feel very blessed to have had. So you just kind of were born and there was a dog? I was born and there was a dog, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was born and, and there, were, there were dogs, I, and, you know, and that, that was pretty much it. And, you know, what's interesting, too, is most of the time we had more than one dog. Oh, so cool. I, think, I think the most we ever had was like four. Oh, God. I, yeah, and I think four was like one was sort of uh, my, if I recall, my sister found it brought it home we had it for like whatever two or three months while we found it a home and then you know we you know it went to another family um but you know it was interesting too i remember being a little little kid and my my grandma uh you know raised pugs she bred pugs right uh -huh. and so i remember even being a little kid and going to my grandma's house and there'd be like a litter of puppies and you would just play with all the puppies, you know, you would actually go and play with the puppies and, and, uh, have fun. And what's funny is her pug was named Rocky. Oh, so. look at that. So, so that at least think. gets kids to want to come visit their grandparents, right? Yeah. I've yeah. got a litter of puppies. You want to come? <laughs> yeah. You want to come? And we used to play with these puppies. I think, I think she was using us probably as babysitters to keep them out of her hair, you know, I'm like, Oh, go play with the puppies for three hours. Keep them busy, wear them out, you know, but it was funny too. Cause I remember even like sometimes, I guess when there was a lot, 
like some of them would come to our house and we would have them at our house, like at a certain age before they, you know, before they got adopted or whatever the case is. And, you know, cause she was a breeder. So, you know, and before they got adopted, they would come at our house. And sometimes some of the puppies were with us at our house when yeah. I guess maybe they had too many. I don't really remember cause we were, you know, we were young, so. Well, you know, we're talking about dogs as our pets and, you know, did you ever stop and wonder like, how did dogs even become pets? Like. In my mind, they were f ferocious wolves, and then suddenly they were pets, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you ever think about that? Like, how did that even happen? Uh, ab absolutely. I mean, it, you know, it it seems like a natural fit for us now, right? Like, we look at dogs and we see the relationship, and we even see how, like, you know, wolves wolves could, you know, mm -hmm. have been, you know, you know, um you know, worked with humans or come together with humans. And, you know, there's so many interesting studies and so much science behind it. Yep. Dogs were the first species that humans domesticated. And it's pretty clear that the ancestors were a wolf, um, not necessarily the same types of wolves we see now living in North America or areas of Europe. It may be in a wolf that is now extinct. The consensus seems to be now that as humans settled in one place or another for even short periods of time, um, they created trash piles. Um, you know, they would um, throw the bones and things that they, hides that they were not eating or using, and that the wolves would come around and start to um, eat that stuff. I mean, they would be um, working as scavengers. And it turns out that a, one of the theories is as people threw stuff out, those wolves who were less frightened, more willing to be near people, got first dibs on the best stuff that got thrown out. And over time, uh, it seems as if they became more and more comfortable being in close proximity to people. Um, there was a famous experiment done in Russia where they actually took um, fur foxes and specifically bred them to be tame, um, to be more comfortable with people. And they found over six, seven, eight generations that um, foxes who were, um, you know, either shy or potentially vicious became quite friendly and they'd start to approach people and even solicit petting and contact. What's interesting also is as a part of what seems to happen, um, which sometimes called the domestication syndrome, is that we saw the color patterns on those foxes started to change. Instead of being a single color, we started to see those piebald blotchy markings, um, something that you would see sort of like on a beagle um, or on a pinto horse. And this seems to be um, something that's common when animals are domesticated. And they also started to see their ears change. Um, they became floppy. Instead of the pricky pointed ears of a fox, the ears started to flop over. And we also saw that they began to become more fecund, more fertile. They, they bred more easily. They bred more often. Vixen usually, the female fox usually come into heat once a year. Some of these domesticated foxes started to become, uh, the, the vixen would come into heat a couple times a year. And so when we think about domestication, there's several things that are pretty typical related to animals as they become domesticated. They become more comfortable near people. Um, it's not the same as just simply being tame. Tame, you can take a wild animal and tame them so they're more comfortable around people, something you might do with a raccoon or another wild animal. But this is something that changes the genetics so that they're actually become more comfortable um, and that it's inbred to them now. We also see that they become more fertile. Um, they, they're easier to breed. They have more young, they breed more frequently, and they tend to actually be less selective in how they're bred, which is important because um, if you're gonna then later selectively breed for particular traits, you wanna ensure that you can pick who's going to be the mother, who's gonna be the father, so you can uh, focus on the traits that you want, um, whether it's speed, um, size, um, and all a, a wide variety of, of other traits. And then we also find that um, 
they tend to, to show what we call neoteny. They, they maintain juvenile characteristics farther into life. Um, fox uh, and wolves, for example, um, they become, uh, during a, there's a critical period when they are bonding with the members of their pack, but it's relatively short. But what we see with dogs, for example, um, there's a critical period for socialization to about 16 weeks. Um, and this is when it's really important to get a dog used to being around people and being around other dogs. And from that, what we see is um, there were probably some mutations that happened and people um, as humans at that time decided to kind of keep those and in particular try to breed them. So it might be uh, they, perhaps one of the first mutations was for dogs that were um, quite a bit bigger, the, the Mastiff type of dog. And these are the dogs that we saw ancient um, people using for uh, draft that actually pull carts and stuff like that. But also they would be used in warfare and then we see the development of dogs, um, the smaller dogs, um, the shorter dogs. Um, that's a single mutation that resulted in um, the smaller dogs uh, having to do with the growth of their leg bones. And obviously, as we, we look at dogs, um, they are probably the most diverse mammalian species on the planet because you see something from the size of a Chihuahua to the size of a Great Dane or an Irish Wolfhound. I mean, it's just dramatic. Um, and you would actually think that they might actually be different species um, in many ways because they are so different from one another. All right, so I love my dog. I, I gotta admit though, he's pretty stupid. I'm not gonna lie and I feel bad saying that. And I know you love your dogs, so. I, I do, I do. Yes, and they're smarter than my dog for sure. Um, but so is the rock next to me. Um, but... <laughs> oh, oh, poor Rocky. Poor Rocky. <laughs> That's why I named him Rocky. No. Yeah, he's dumb as a rock. No, no, no. I'm sure he has his, you know, his uh, qualities because most most dogs do, right? Most dogs are very have very redeeming qualities to them. Yeah, yeah. So, what do you love the most about your dogs? So, I think Zoe. Uh, honestly, I've had a lot of dogs. Like, I do not uh, like. I'm a dog person. My family is dog people. I believe if you're a dog person, most people come from dog people. That's how you become a dog person, right? You know, they, it's, you know, and Z Zoe, you know, and I, I'm sorry, Captain, but Zoe is probably my favorite dog I've ever had. And I had one dog, Winston, that lived for 21 years, right? But Zoe, there's just like this bond with Zoe, even though she's sort of annoying because she's really loud. And, but there's just this sweetness about her. Like, I feel like, I feel like it is such unconditional love that without a doubt, she would give her life for me. Like she would not run away from anything. She's not afraid of anything. She is, we call her mama dog because she's sort of like this protector. She's the mother to everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the thing I love about her the most. It's not that, you know, but it's like her, she, st like she stares into your eyes. Like she wants mm -hmm. to talk to you so bad. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is really deep bond with Zoe and Captain is probably the cuddliest dog I've ever had and the most affectionate dog. Like he is always leaning on someone. He's always giving someone kisses. He's always in someone's lap. He's, you know, he, so he's just so affectionate and he just loves his people. You know, he loves me. Mm -hmm. He loves the girls. He loves Dawn. He loves James, Zach, Kira. Like he loves everyone. You know, he's just like a little, you know, we, it's funny because Zoe, we, we do this thing where we do a group hug. And Zoe, we call her, she's the angry pickle because she always like, she always like, is like, rrr, rrr, rrr. like we want you to hug her, right? And Captain, we call the cuddly, the girls named them the cuddly tomato because he's such a mushy, like, you know, like you just mush into him. So I don't know. That's probably the things I love uh, most about those dogs. But honestly, I just could not see my life without a dog or dogs in it. You know, I, there's been very, maybe like two years of my life where I didn't have a dog. Yeah. That's, that's about it. Yeah. Well, like I said, Rocky's not the smartest dog I've ever had, but he's got some qualities. Um, he's, you know, he's, um, so we got him and I know we're going to talk about, you know, where we get our dogs um, in, a, in a few minutes, but we, we got him from Santa. You know, you don't know what you're going to get no matter where you go, right? But mm -hmm. 
when we, when, when Santa first brought Rocky, he was uh, very mellow, very, um, mm-hmm. just, he was just very mellow and calm. And so I've thought this was great because my, my son has such anxiety and he's always so nervous and crazy. Maybe this is the thing that will calm him down, make him feel safe and they will be buddies. And no, it worked the opposite way. And so my son has rubbed off on Rocky and they are like two brothers and they, I mean, and when I tell you, it's like they're they're playmates. They are constantly fighting like children, you know, like, Mm -hmm. Oh, get off me, Rocky. And then Rocky wants attention. And then Michael wants to play with him, but he doesn't want to play with Michael. And it's just like, Oh my gosh, the two Mm -hmm. of you, you know, this is what it must feel like to have two children because the two of them just drive each other crazy. But then at night they're like sleeping together and they love Mm -hmm. each other. So, Mm -hmm. you know, he's got a very playful, uh, crazy personality. He's weird in that he's not food motivated. So that's difficult for me um, to work with because I am trying to train a dog that has no motivation at all. Um, yeah, but he could be play motivated. I mean, not all dogs are, you know, food motivated. Some are play yeah. motivated or toy motivated or, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I'm working on it. He's not easily trainable, if that's a word. But I had a boxer and she, um, she was the love of my life. And, you know, I, I tell Rocky all the time, Pebbles, but just she's rolling over in her grave right now when she sees what I'm working hey, with hey, here. He's, he's going to come into his own. He's going to come into his own. <laughs> all dogs, all dogs are special. You know, she was a like, boxer, though, and she was uh, just, you know, you explain that bond that you have with Zoe. It's it just, I've never felt anything like that before. She was the love of my life. And even when I was pregnant, you know, she would lay on my belly and she would kiss my belly and she knew, and, you know, she was, she didn't have the patience for Michael, but, um, you know, she didn't bother with him. She just was like, this, this is what you brought me. You had me and you got this, you know, and she was, she was just a prissy little, little bitch. That's, but she was, you know, she was mine mm-hmm. and she was smart, smarter than a lot of humans. So that's uh, what I loved most about her, but Rocky, he's, he's okay. He, um, he did, def- you know, try to protect me the other night. Uh, Justin didn't come home until late and I fell asleep and we thought that Rocky was pretty stupid, but his instincts kicked in and he started howling before, you know, he even got out of the car. And uh, so at least he uh, did something. He did. He did something. Right? <laughs> he, did, he, he did his job. I mean, look, that is, you know, that is for dogs, you know, for certain dogs, especially certain dogs like Zoe. She definitely has that I'm the protector role. You know, certain dogs see that as their as their job. And, you know, and that so much depends on breed, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and who they are. So and what they were designed to do, you know, especially as we get all these breeds and, you know, people have mixed breeds now and months. And, you know, it's very interesting how how some of those traits come out. Um, once dogs became domesticated, it seems that they traveled everywhere with humans. Um you know, for example, we know that as uh, humans were, were coming in expansion out of Southeast Asia into Europe, they brought dogs with them and they actually mingled with the dogs that were already in Europe at that time. Our our general sense of the history is some of the earliest dogs um, that were bred for purpose were often bred for hunting. Um, and these were the coursing dogs. And for example, Salukis, um, probably one of the oldest known breeds of dogs, were used by the Egyptians uh, for hunting uh, antelope. Uh, They're quite fast. And so we see the greyhounds, the Lukies, the Irish wolfhounds. Um, These were some of the early ones. Then probably the next ones were some of the herding dogs. Um, Once we domesticated goats and sheep, the dogs became helpful in terms of how do we manage these other domestic species. We probably see the one of the next groups of dogs the hounds um, these were dogs the coursing breeds the sight hounds follow animals by by seeing them and chasing them the hounds use scent um, so this would be the bloodhounds um, basset hounds beagles and all of those types of dogs another set of dogs which is interesting that didn't get developed until later are the um the sporting dogs what we call gun dogs the pointers the retrievers and that's because they're only useful if you're actually able to kill an animal at a distance and so we had to wait until firearms were developed because um 
with the hounds, they would bring an animal to ground um, up a tree or somewhere where you could uh, come up and we see the old tapestries from medieval England of the, the nobles on their horses with spears when they would they would chase boar and then they would kill them with spears um obviously that famous scene in uh, uh game of thrones where the where the king gets injured by the boar um and then the the gun dogs and then we start seeing the proliferation of all the other what we call companion breeds um, the Pekingese and the Chihuahuas and uh, Havanese and, and many of those other breeds. Um, sometimes the, the thought was the reason you, you had these small breeds is they'd sit on your lap and people weren't as sanitary back in those days. Um, so they'd be often have fleas on them. And one of the stories is that uh, you kept a small lap dog because fleas would jump from you onto the lap dog and so they were uh, uh, flea attractants after that um people became more and more interested in in the clarity of breeds and and maintaining pure breed lines and this really happened probably in the in the 1800s and in particular the the la last half of the 19th century when we saw the formation of the breed clubs um the kennel club in great britain uh, the american kennel club in the united states and they formed what they call stud books um, until that time um everybody kept their own records of what dogs they had and how they were breeding and the lineage of their particular types of dogs but with the formation of the kennel clubs, this now became much more formalized. Um, so that, for example, if you were breeding pointers, um, you could only register a dog as a pointer if both of its parents were registered pointers as well. And so this is when we saw the really the, the refinement of how we're looking at, at breeds. And what's interesting now, um, something 200 years, 100 years later, 150 years later, as we're seeing, um, actually going back to some of the, the old techniques, the old style of breeding dogs, um, it used to be they would cross two different types of dogs. Um, a common type of dog that actually poachers would use is something called a lurcher. And this was um, usually a terrier crossed with um, a greyhound or a coursing breed. And poachers would use them because they were quick and silent and they would be able to, to chase down hare, um, another game, and kill it without, um, without the noble needing or the gamekeepers on that estate or that property so poachers were using them so the lurchers were were something that it was a, a what we would now call a designer breed and that's certainly become all the the trend now in the in the dog world is uh labradoodles and cockapoos and um, all the different mixes that people have and what they're looking for always is desirable characteristics in in the dog whether it's in the aesthetic appeal of how they look or in their behavior and um, for example one of the reasons people were breeding uh, labradoodles is the sense that perhaps they would be uh, less allergenic so people who had problems with allergies to dogs that these labradoodles might be um, less of a problem for them you know we talked about how our dogs came into our lives to begin with mm -hmm. and how we got our our current dogs um, you know, and there are different ways that you can go about this. So Brian, you went to North Shore, you went to a shelter, right? And you adopted your dogs. Um, you know, in the past I've purchased dogs from a pet store and please don't stone me or anything. I've purchased dogs from a pet store. Um, but there's also breeders. You can go directly to the mm -hmm. breeders. In this case, you know, Rocky came from the North Pole. So that's another option, but right. you know, regardless, right. Then you have to mm -hmm. consider, there are things to consider no matter how you purchase. So uh, why don't you talk from experience? Why don't you talk from experience about adopting? Yeah. So I've had, I've had dogs from each of these facets, right. You know, over the years, I don't even know how many dogs have been part of my life. And when we were kids, dogs were from breeders, you know, um, you know, I did have one dog that was from pet store, you know, and then my other most, but most of my dogs have been from rescues. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think the, in my opinion, and we could start with sort of the, the breeders, you know, I, I think the pro about 
you know, the pros and cons for it coming from a breeder. The pro really is, you know, exactly what the dog is, right? Or it should be, you know, it's, right. it should be well documented. These are the parents. This is how it was sired or whatever the case is, you know, and the, this is the lineage of the dog. If it's an AKC, you know, um, registered dog or whatever the case is, is the parent, you know, so you have the whole lineage of the dog. You actually know the parents or know the temperament of the parents. And a lot of times when you you get a dog from a breeder, you may even get to meet the parents. So you could sort of see the temperament. You could see the size of the dogs, you know, whether it's a female or male, if you could see the parent. So I think that's one of the biggest um, pros, you know, of getting a dog from a breeder. You know exactly what you're getting. You know, if you do your research and you meet the breeder and you, you know, go with someone that's certified or whatever the case is, you know exactly what you're getting, you know. That to me is the biggest pro of of going to a breeder and and getting a dog. My parents, you know, we had an old English sheepdog that was a purebred old English sheepdog when we were kids, you know. So they would often um, get purebred dogs. You know, and a lot of times, though, you have to travel pretty far to yeah. get those dogs, you know. Um, but it, it tends to also come at a lower cost than going to a pet store. Not as low as adopting, but it, you know, it's kind of the, the step in between. So there's also that cost, but yeah, I'd say the only con I can really think of is, is just travel, finding a breeder, you know, it's right. probably that process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh and sometimes God. actually, sometimes too, with breeders, mm -hmm. you actually have to wait. So sometimes yeah. breeders are, you know, they know their dog is pregnant and they're putting it out there already. So you may have to wait till the dogs are born or the, you know, or, you know, obviously or the dog is eight is, weeks right. or whatever the time frame is. So there is, there is a wait time too. So if Santa is going to bring the dog, unfortunately, sometimes Santa may not be able to get a purebred dog in time, right? If it's for you know, an occasion, let's right. say if it is for Christmas or, you know, um, something like that, or you want it for a specific time of year, maybe you're off during the summer. So, mm -hmm. you know, you want to be able to train it or spend more time with right. your dog or something. Yeah. Um, what about I, adoption? I, I think the biggest pro for adoption is we've all seen all those studies. There are so many stray dogs out there. And I mean, they're dogs. They're not, they're not really feral, you know, they're dogs, right? They're not wild animals, they're dogs, you know, and they have been domesticated um, to some degree. And, you know, and I think there are so many out there. The biggest pro is you are actually helping those dogs to stay alive. And by that, I mean, like most of them, you know, unfortunately, like if they don't get adopted, if they're in a shelter, they may be in a kill shelter, which, you you know, is horrible. That means they're going to be put down or they may be from countries where they may not see them necessarily as pets. They may see more as nuisances or, you know, varmints or something like that, where they may put them down because there are so many. So I think to me, the biggest pro is actually being able to save a dog that may have not been otherwise saved mm -hmm. i think the con for me is you really don't know what you're getting <laughs> in, in many ways Ew. the breed you don't know the temperament all those things we talked about that mm -hmm. was a, a pro for a purebred dog you don't know where this dog came from you don't know the environment it came from you don't know if it was starving if it was fighting with other dogs if it was feral you know and and sometimes you don't even know what country those dogs come from because there are adult dogs that you know move from country to country you know through some of these um you know services so you just don't know what that dog has experienced even if it's a puppy you you don't know you know for instance you could get a dog that was rescued off the street let's say and mm -hmm. maybe you know 10 generations or five generations above him have never have not been in a home Right. You know, so you don't really know what you're getting until you get it and you start yeah. working with it and you see them develop. So that's probably the biggest con to me of, you know, adopting from like a shelter or a rescue. Yeah, I agree. My aunt, uh, she rescued um, her pit bull from a kill shelter and the pit bull was, you know, actually trained to fight. And, um, you know, it, ta it also takes, you know, as you're, uh, adapting them, right? It, it takes a lot of time and patience yeah. and, and, and that's a commitment. So, yeah. you know, 
it is a commitment you have to make sure that you can handle that well let's let's talk about that too so besides the you know because there is a commitment working with a dog especially if you adopt you know an adult dog but i think you know to me it, you should never get a dog unless you're willing to make a 15-year commitment or whatever the right. life expectancy is of a dog right so without that don't don't even no matter where you're getting it from i don't right. care if it's a breeder or a pet store or you're adopting it like if you're not willing to make a commitment to that animal for 15 years don't do it like just don't <laughs> that's yeah. any that's anywhere yep and then there's so, the pet store mm -hmm. and i mean i can't find too many pros with the, with the pet store except for the fact that it's quicker right um mm -hmm. it is you know i want a dog now um sometimes they do come with like a year of you know veterinary care um you know and they're already vaccinated and they have a lot of things um you know it's a it's a little bit easier to know where what they are um but still it's not quite as direct as coming from the breeder you mm -hmm. know themselves so you have to trust that that the pet store is legit too but i think in a sense you're also giving a dog a home right i mean yeah. those dogs get expensive you know they get really really expensive i i i and, and i i i agree i i think the way like the way i see it and yes you are absolutely giving an animal home who may not have a home right but the you uh, the way i see it like a shelter right mm -hmm. that dog may never get a home yeah. we're usually a pet store chances somebody's are somebody's gonna buy them eventually. someone's gonna buy them right mm -hmm. that's it's a business yeah. that person's gonna make sure that dog gets sold right because yeah. they're you know it's monetary right yeah so. not that you can't get a great dog because i had one dog from a pet store and it was a great dog you, you know so it, it's 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 a living thing i think is what we have to remember right. and you know as a sentient you know a higher sentient being you know it it has this right to live you know as it, no matter where it comes from so i mean and the cons there are our cost you know you know i mean sometimes i i don't know if this plays a role but sometimes when they're in the the pet stores, they come home with all kinds of coughs and things like that, but that could be anywhere, you know, that could be yeah, in could a be shelter, a shelter. Or that could yeah. be anywhere. So, yeah. you know, that's kind of just across the board, do, but. Do you think one of the things that people see, cause you know, there's a lot of people that are anti pet store, right? Mm -hmm. Anti adopting. Do you think a lot of people think because, and, and I'm not saying they are, but every dog in a pet store is from a puppy mill and it supports puppy mills. Do you think that's why a lot of people think pet stores are you know not legit well, or not a good way to adopt not just that it's it's a, a, yes that yes and i did i worked in a veterinary office for i don't know maybe a year and i remember you know the staff they were just so against pet stores but yet they had a you know a contract with a pet store and they were the vet right. for them but um that's neither here nor there but um you know one of the things that i also heard a lot was oh you're you know kind of this concept of like, if you were, if there were no pet stores, you'd be adopting the animals who really need homes instead of just producing mm -hmm. more dogs. You know, like we should, mm -hmm. we should help the right. dogs that need homes first that we're here, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that about vets because when I brought, uh, you know, captain, when he was a puppy and I brought him into the vet, that's how he goes to one of the, uh, vet techs, I guess they are, mm -hmm. is their title. Mm -hmm. She's like, Oh, Where'd you get him? I'm like, oh, he's from, you know, this shelter. She likes, she goes, oh, he looks like a, that shelter special. So like, yeah, which was interesting too, because is, are shelters like that sometimes? I mean, you, you know, it brings up a point. Do shelters get certain sort of like, okay, here's all the dogs that couldn't get adopted. Let's say right. like these last chance shelters. And, you know, I mean, it, it's interesting that you say that, that the vet tech actually, you know what I mean? Like they were talking about like these adopted mm -hmm. dogs from pet stores, but it seems like they have some opinions on, you know, even animals maybe from shelters is, I guess, is my point. Yeah. Well, everybody's so. got an opinion about something. Yeah. So ultimately, like you were talking about, you know, you, you just have to kind of, no matter where you're getting this dog from, it comes with certain considerations. So, yeah. so the number one question that I would have you ask is what changes am I willing to make in my life to accommodate the dog? What? Doesn't the dog just come and join our family? No, you have to think about what are the different things you're willing to do? 
So a dog is not going to be the one that takes you on walks. You have to take the dog on walks. If you're a little bit more of a couch potato, find a dog that's more of a lap dog or that doesn't need as much of outdoor exercise in the walk, maybe a smaller breed. Or if you're a marathon runner and you are active all the time and you travel a lot, maybe you need to have a breed that can run with you on trails or run with you on concrete. And that's a different kind of breed and a different kind of dog that you need to make those considerations about to see what really matches you. Um, also to understanding the constraints that you have in getting a dog. What's the size limitation or breed specific legislation that may be in your area, your building, your HOA. And these are specific details you should know before you get anywhere close to uh, meeting a dog or thinking about adopting a dog. You need to understand your situation is going to dictate what type of life the animal's going to have. So really be mindful of that. Um, a story that I have is there was a couple that was very, very sweet and they came to an adoption fair, adopted a dog, but they, and they knew that they were going to love this dog, but they had a roommate and that roommate didn't come with them to the adoption fair, didn't come with them to meet and greet the dog. And after about 24 hours, the roommate said, sorry, you can't have this dog. You can have a dog, but not this dog. And it was just a heartbreaking you know, circumstance. Uh, so really be mindful and think about what are the limitations that you have just situationally when you're trying to adopt a dog, because that's going to affect that dog's life. The next thing you need to understand is that the animal has needs themselves. And if you're like me and you go for rescue, or if you are going to a breeder, these animals are going to have different personality traits that express themselves at various times. Um, I'll use examples from my board game. If you're looking for a dog with obedience or maybe the grooming or different kinds of temperament or health constraints and, and considerations, you are going to have to really make sure you're well-researched into the breed, into the age, and get as much information as you can because some of the sweetest dogs are that, I, that I've uh, worked with and adopted have been senior dogs, right? Dogs that are in the care system that just need a second chance at life. So really think about what are those needs of the animal? And those should come first because if you can address those and you're comfortable addressing those, then you will have a wonderful match in your home. And it's going to change you as and change your life just as much as it's going to change that animal's life. So if you take nothing else from what I'm saying about how you pick a dog or, or how you get to uh, figure out, you know, if you need a puppy, a rescue um, or, or something else, um, Number one is, if you can, go sit with the animal. And I'm talking an hour, hour and a half. Just be in their presence. See how they respond to you. Um, spend time with them early on. Speak to the foster agency or the breeder to understand what personality traits they might already know about. Maybe it's a health thing like a food allergy or a health thing like, hey, they need a lot of running around and exercise. A temperament item, they're very good with people, they're skittish around tall people, those sorts of things. Um, grooming needs, are they going to shed their coat and blow their coat uh, every six months? Okay, so speaking of breeds, as we mentioned earlier, we did DNA test our dogs and we use the Embark DNA kit to do that. So just a little swab in their mouth. But, um, you know, Brian, what did what were you told these these two dogs were? So these are our two dogs. This is Zoe and this is Captain Jack Sparrow. Uh, both of them were rescues. They were rescued from actually the same rescue here locally where we live. We were told uh, Zoe was a blue tick coon hound, which you can see from her coloration, she definitely has that blue tick in her. You know, she definitely has hound ears and she has very distinct hound features, like physically, but also even in her personality. She loves treeing uh, squirrels and raccoons. She loves chasing, she bays, she's very loud. Actually, she's 121 decibels when she gets 
it's going. But she's actually a relatively small dog. She's only about 45 pounds. Where Captain, we were told he was a lab mix. Um, Captain is nine months old right now. That's when he was 10 weeks. Uh, he is, well, I would say he's 70 pounds right now. Um, so he's a big boy. And as you can see, you know, he does look, he does have lab features, but he also has a lot of ticking. Like here on his four paws, we actually see the ticking. Um, he's definitely very lab esque. He loves leading in people. He's super friendly, super affectionate, loves to be with the family, doesn't ever want to be alone, actually. He's a little bit of a nervous Nelly, but I'm guessing he also has some hound in him from the ticking on his paws and actually on his chest. He also has a very narrow head um, in comparison to most legs. Really good boy, really good girl. Then they got two better dogs. Um, they're both super affectionate, and we're going to test them and see what they come out of this. Okay. And I was told by Santa that Rocky was a puggy bear. So Santa brought us Rocky, and he brought us some paperwork with Rocky. So we were able to learn a little bit about him. Uh, Rocky is called a puggy bear. French bulldog. No, he's not a French bulldog. He's a puggy bear. I have we don't have a French bulldog. Um, we only have Rocky. So Rocky is what they call a puggy bear. And right now we can only see Rocky's tail. But he is supposed to be a mixture between a pug, a Bichon free, and a Shih Tzu. So these are three purebreds and I, I didn't know much about these breeds before we got Rocky. We are now embarking on this new uh, type of dog and what we've discovered in the year that we've had him is that he's um, he's not exactly the smartest dog we've ever had. What? Huh? He's not the smartest dog. Oh, yeah. yeah. But he is loving and yeah. he is full of energy. Rocky, you ready to get DNA tested? Visit EmbarkVet.com, activate, create an account, enter your dog's unique activation code. Okay. Make sure it's been 30 minutes since your pup last ate. Swab the lower cheek pouches for 30 to 60 seconds to fully soak the sponge. You think Rocky's gonna sit still for 30 to 60 seconds? Okay, so we read the instructions and we're ready to test Captain, right, buddy? So, Captain, you haven't eaten in like what, like an hour? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got him? Okay. 30 to 60 seconds. Alright, I'm gonna soak that. Is that yummy? Delicious? Is that yummy? That's so sort of yummy. Is that yummy? I got a lower cheek. Lower cheek pouch. Again. No, it's not 30 to 60 seconds. Ow, 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 ow. Ow, 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 ow. Come on, Rocky, open. Okay, hold on. Alright. I'm not really getting cake. Come here, I need to soak it. Yeah, come here, Rocky. How are you? Swabby, swabby. Swabby, swabby. So we finished those and we're doing the same thing. We are turning it over. We are putting it in the vial and we're shaking the vial. Now, we're gonna actually put it into the mail and we're gonna send them off and see what they say. Now we are going to find out exactly what they are. Now, here's the thing before we open up our results. I was under the impression that Santa lied, right? And I did not feel, and I joke around about, you know, lions and meerkats and whatever, but I did not see Rocky as these three breeds. Okay. And I was, I was kind of thinking he looked a little bit more like a terrier. There were some terriers that I had seen pictures of that he really resembles. Mm -hmm. So, and his personality, you know, we talked about some of those, you know, personality traits just, just there with Alex, you know, think about, I, I think of it as personality. It just did not fit what the, you know, personality was for these dogs, in my opinion. Right. right. And so I was almost a hundred percent certain that Rocky was going to be something other than he was. 
So okay. want to find out? Yes, find out. So remember what they said. Mm-hmm. Look at that. We got some Shih Tzu. And we've got some what? Pug. And what is this? And oh. there's the Bichon. So, so pretty- Rock is exactly <laughs> what they said he was. <laughs> now, he does have, he is primarily, you know, half of him is Pug. Right, but so, that's that's sort of what you said. It was mm-hmm. pug and this teddy, this teddy bear yeah. dog, which is made of the other two. So that makes sense that fifty percent of him is pug. Mm-hmm. There's the similar. Uh, come on, dogs like mine. Here we go. They do look like terriers. All right, so well, that's just we- that's just AI. So you know that's just AI that's matching up their photos. Right, but when you look at the percentage, right, he's 87% like they mine. A score of 100% means they share the exact same breed mix, right? Uh-huh. So these are pretty high. I mean, 87%, but this dog right here, Bruce, has Rocky Smile. So that's the Shih Tzu. You could see the, sh- the Shih Tzu mm-hmm. Smile. And then right there, that face, that's the Rocky face. So... You know, it made me feel like, okay, I wasn't lied to uh, when I started seeing some of these other results and I could see certain traits in dogs that were similar. You know, when you look at his relatives, though, I mean, his relatives are are really pug. I, I mean, they, they're they all yeah. pug. Well, that, that could be the people that also test it, right? So uh-huh. it's sort of hard to say because you don't know who's testing what. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, most of them are pug like, but when I saw the relatives, I start and the, you know, similar dogs, I started to feel a little bit better. I saw the stands, you know, and like they have very similar traits when they're sitting and, and standing and smiling. That smile, though, is a face only a mother could love. I swear. It's just, it's just creepy. But yes, yeah, so Rocky is exactly what I thought he was. Or, well, I'm sorry, not what I thought he was, what he said he was, right? Mm hmm. <laughs> Now, Brian. I'm I'm ready. So we're gonna look at Zoe first. Okay. Let's look at Zoe first. Oh, it's Zoe with a Y. It's Zoe with a Y. All right. What do we got? So we knew she was a coonhound, an English coonhound. Mm-hmm. A tree walking coonhound. <laughs> and an American foxhound, which pretty much is almost the breed mix that makes up a blue tick coonhound. tree walkers brian those damn tree walking coon hounds yeah so i mean that is pretty much you know those those hound mixes the fox hound and coon hound are pretty much what makes a blue tick coon hound there's also like um a blue something i forgot what it is it's a french dog we'll put it we'll put it in the you know in the lower uh in the bottom of here and tell you what it is but there's also another type of dog that i know goes into a blue tick coon hound but I, i think they weren't even recognized as a breed until maybe like i don't know 50 years ago so, and they're from the South, which she's from Tennessee. So it makes a hundred percent sense that uh, this is what, what makes it up. Now, what's interesting is we talked about what, what these dogs look like, right? Mm-hmm. Well, let me bring that back up. Now, do her friends look like her? They do. Hold on. Let me share my screen. So, Zoe's relatives, now they didn't find, uh, they found close family, but this looks very similar mm-hmm. to Zoe. As she has a little more black around her eyes, mm-hmm. but they all pretty much look very similar to Zoe. But, you know, coon hounds sort of all have that same look and hounds have that, you know, that uh, interesting look to themselves. This one really doesn't. 
Mm. Um, you know, there's this one. That one looks facially like Zoe, you know, but they all look pretty similar. But she didn't have, um, you know, they had close family, so like a human's first cousin. So mm. this dog looks very similar to the way Zoe looks. Now, Captain, on the other hand, was more interesting. All right, so we don't have a video for Captain Jack, but we do have some graphics that we can show you of the family tree. Mm -hmm. Now, what was interesting is Captain came as an American village dog. What does that mean, right? <laughs> an American that village dog. What, what does that is mean? That? <laughs> yeah, what is that? So, and why didn't you use Captain's full name? That's just wrong. Uh, well, because we just call him Cap or Captain. <laughs> I don't know. We didn't we didn't put it Captain Jack Sparrow in there, or maybe I don't know. Maybe we put it as his middle name in here. But what was interesting now, Captain came back as a rat terrier, which there's no way this dog is about seventy pounds at ten months. Um, that rat terrier even comes in there, but obviously he has some DNA in common with it. A Danish Swedish farm dog, which he does sort of look like, right? If I'm just going to pop it open, he has very similar ears, but his face doesn't really look like this at all. And these uh -huh. are smaller dogs. Wait, go to the rat terrier. Sure. Yeah, he yeah, looks no. nothing like. That. <laughs> So, okay, I, I don't know. Maybe the eyes. I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, not even. Uh, it, it. It's like crazy. It. And then German Shepherd. Most people know what a German Shepherd looks yeah, like. No, so I'm not gonna. Not I'm not gonna. You know, do this now. Uh, you know, click on this. But what was interesting is he came back as an American village dog. So what is that? An American village dog is basically a mutt from you know, uh, you know, the Caribbean. Now, what was interesting is when we did some research and we knew he was from Turks and Caicos, we didn't know what a pot cake was, but basically he is a pot cake dog, which this confirmed he's a pot cake dog. They're basically mutts from around, you know, the Caribbean, like the Bahamas. He's from Turks and Caicos. And basically he's just, he's just a mutt. So they, this was the closest thing they could find with him of these breeds. Now, like I said, he looks like a giant, he looks like a lab, you know, he, he's the size of a lab physically. Um, you know, he's about 70 pounds and he's, uh, you know, 10 months old, but, but yeah, he's just, he's just a giant mutt. We learned he was just a giant mutt, but it did confirm he's a pot cake, which is what we assumed after we started doing some research after we adopted him, you know, and, uh, we realized he was from Turks and Caicos. He probably was this pot cake. And when we look at pot cakes, I don't know if I could pull up his picture here. Now, it won't let me pull up his picture. But what was interesting, too, is you see here, they have him at 48 pounds. Uh -uh. He, he, he was 48 pounds when he was like five months old. You know? I love the wolfiness statistic. <laughs> How much wolfiness do you have? Does your so dog all dogs have? have it's interesting because <laughs> all dogs have wolfiness in Embark, which is sort of cool because basically what it shows is most dogs are under 1%, um, you know, and occasionally they're from 2 to 4%, and very rarely. And, and it, I guess it just means how much wolf is still in them, right. you know, is really what it comes down to. So, but Captain basically is a pot cake dog. He's obviously a lot bigger than this um and he's just getting bigger i'm guessing he's gonna top out around 90 pounds when he's a year <laughs> maybe 80 we'll see but he thank goodness he's a giant snuggly he's a super snuggly he's super snuggly <laughs> yeah and he is he is he's a big that's what my daughter wanted me to put in there <laughs> <laughs> so he's a super Hello, Brian, dog. i wouldn't be surprised with your typos i just figured it yeah <laughs> yeah there you go there you go he is super snuggly for me, honestly, I've had great dogs of so many different breeds or mixed breeds. I don't think breed really matters. I, you know, I think it's really what dog, you know, works with you, which dog you have connection with, and what dog honestly fits your lifestyle. Because dogs, like people, have different needs. Some need more physical activity, some need less. And I think mm -hmm. it's really finding that connection and letting, you know, as we learn, letting that dog pick you. Um. Dogs, they, you know, with the short lives, they teach us to be present. They teach us to appreciate, um, to appreciate every moment, you know, and I know it sounds like hackneyed and everything, but to, to stop and smell the roses and, and then maybe pee on them. Um, but like, God, dogs are just, 
ah, I don't even know how to explain this. They, they enrich every aspect of our lives. Um, I can't think of a time that I, I have a, a new puppy nail who's sleeping under me and will probably snore soon. Um, I, that dog has helped me through quarantine because my, my dog that passed, uh, wasn't, wasn't cuddly anymore. Uh, he helped me through losing that, that dog. He has helped me through so many things and I've only had him about a, a year and, you know, three months or something. Um, the emotional support, the just being a goofball, uh, when, when, you know, you're, you're depressed and everything is just so serious in your life. I have a video last week. I was sitting there eating breakfast and stressing and trying to, you know, get work done while I'm inhaling my oatmeal. And I look over and my dog is licking the wall. No, no reason in particular. Uh, just, I guess the wall was there and it needed to be licked. Um, but he makes me laugh. Um, they, they help us get out and get exercise and, uh, you know, enjoy that time in nature and, and get out of our houses and get out of our heads. Um, just spending time with, with your own dog, with another dog plug for volunteering with a rescue. Um, it, it just completely changes your life. It, there's so many, uh, medical benefits to it from health to mental health. Um, but it really, it just, life is better with a dog.